as if you were at home. And all my ushers are sitting down very confused because I didn't take the offering, did I? <laughs> That's what happens when you move around the order of service. You forget to do things. We're going to start, we're going to start the sermon while we take the offering. Why don't we do that? Come on up. Okay, I must be on holiday. Oh, I don't know that I, I've ever forgotten to take the offering before. This is a first. Very much so. I've never done that before. I've forgotten other things. I don't know Anyways, imagine for a moment somebody who lives as, in, as if they are in poverty, but they have riches in the bank. Coming out of the Depression years, there were many who, once the economy of the world got going again, and they started to put some money in the bank, always lived in perpetual fear that they would one day slip back to the days of depression. Understandable. My grandparents' generation. My grandpa was raised a young family during the heart of the depression. He always kind of lived. The rest of his life kind of always nervous about money. Always a little bit worried, and that's much better than going the other way, right? Spending like crazy and all that. But somehow there was a little bit of a mindset that even though there was money in the bank, we'd better live as though we're in poverty. Do you know a lot of Christians do that? Choose to live in poverty even though there's a lot of riches that stand behind them. Did you realize that according to the promises of Scripture, you have incomparable riches? In fact, incomparable riches because we have a promise of God that we are alive in Jesus. We have the full riches of God available to us. You already have the full riches of God in your life. Do you believe it? Do you live like the full riches of God are available to you? They exist in you. And it is a promise of God that I am already living in the riches of God's glorious, eternal kingdom. Not one day. I have them now. Do I use them or do I just let them waste the bank? We're going to come to Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 7. I'll read the first part of it now. We read it a little earlier. But there we read, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. These promises, these ideas that I've got on the screen behind me are all based on who God is. The riches of God based on his personality, based on the depths of his love. None of these ideas has anything to do with how good or how rotten you or I are. You were dead and you were made alive. We have a deep need of this grace of God in our lives. And it talks here about he's, he's raised us up and he's placed us in the heavenly realms, done through Jesus. You ever fail at a job situation? Gone to work and messed up? Never happened to anybody? That's in what not, but okay. Maybe not. Okay for me. How about going to church in the morning for day to take the offering? We can all mess up. At work occasionally, right? And sometimes we get embarrassed because it can even become an evident that uh, to everyone around us that, hey, I'm not quite as perfect at my job as I thought I did. I made a big mistake. I'm going to tell you about somebody who probably was very embarrassed by how he did at work one day. It was a Roman executioner who put Jesus on the cross. And he thought he succeeded at putting Jesus into the grave. And do you know what? He walked away pretty embarrassed because he rose again. He was out of there. 
Life beat death. Absolutely. Last week, if you were with us, if you weren't, there's a to our website, you can find last week's sermon, but we came to a promise of God that came out of 1 Thessalonians that was an answer to a question of something that's happening. In this, this city of Thessalonica, in northern Greece, Paul showed up there, he preached the gospel, some people came to Jesus, he did it a second week, some people came to Jesus, he did it a third week, people came to Jesus, but a riot also started. And after three weeks of preaching to the people and teaching the people about Jesus, he was chased out of town. And they were left, there was a church left there that had three weeks of teaching of what Jesus was all about. Now imagine if all you knew about Christianity was three sermons. It's not a ton of information. They do know that Jesus is coming back. Victorious in judgment. <laughs> They're waiting with anticipation. But somebody in the church passes away. And they have this sudden question, what happened to that person? Because they haven't got that teaching. They don't have that information. Paul writes to them and says, you know what? In Jesus? They'll make it right. That person's not gone. That person is still kept in my eternal hope and reality. Because life in Jesus is more powerful than death. He goes on, he tells them that they will return with new spiritual bodies that come out of eternity. What exactly that looks like, we don't know. But they are ones that will never die again. And despite our sinfulness, despite our commitment to this world, God has acted in mercy on our behalf. He has already made us alive. He has seated us in the, he in the heavenly realms. Now this week was the full first week of summer holidays, right? Kids off school. So if we're gonna talk about summer holidays, why don't we tackle some grammar? Does that sound good? Because that sounds like a good thing to do in the beginning of July. Not really. There's something really interesting in grammar. Something that's always caught my eye. And that is this. It has to do with verbal tenses. And you look and say, boy, that doesn't sound very exciting. It's the fact of this. If you look at all these, these words up here, all these verbs, they're in the past tense. God being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved. And he, catch this, he has, it's in the past, he's raised us up. It's already happened. He has raised us up. He has already seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's done. This isn't something to yet happen. We're going to come to a promise in the second half of this that is yet to come. This has already occurred if you believe in Jesus. You are already seated in the heavenly realms. You are already there. God has acted in his mercy. We're talking about these promises of God that have to do with what God is doing in our lives and what God will do in our lives. Well, here is one that is a promise that is already being fulfilled fully, absolutely, and that is you are already in the throne room. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lives in our lives. God is here. God is present. And more and more as we learn to surrender our lives to the Holy Spirit, the more we understand where we already are. The more we understand that we are more in the presence of God than we are in the presence of this world. It is a finished proposition. From a spiritual perspective, you are already one who sits in the throne room of the king of kings. You have nothing more to do to get there. If you accept Jesus as your savior, you are already seated in the thrones of heaven. You should therefore see yourself as God sees you. 
think that might make a difference where we're seated? We struggle. There's still things in this world we struggle, but we're already seeing the throne room of God. But this quote in our bulletin this week, the joy comes. Watch for it. Expect it as you would the morning sunrise or even the evening twilight. It will come to you. Do what people of the promise do. Keep coming to Jesus. Even when the trail is dark. We need to keep this in mind where our thoughts are. Where we see ourselves. I was reading the story this week of a gentleman from the United States who was in the army during the time of the, the war in Vietnam. And he was one of the longest serving guys when I kept getting sent over because he started, he got drafted, and then he went to school and became a pastor. And they sent him back as a chaplain later. So he ended up doing a couple of tours of duty. People asked him how he managed to be able to keep going at that time. And he said it was, you know, he said he desperately, desperately, of course, wanted to be out of this war zone to get home. And he made this comment, toward the end, the only way to be able to keep sane was to be able to long for home like no one can imagine. We need to learn to long for the heavenly throne. To long to be in the presence of Jesus. To want to find our full satisfaction there. To stay focused on what God has already done. To focus on where we exist already. So these verses continue with this. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Do you know, believers in Jesus... Are the people in this world who are most blessed? More than anyone else? Compare yourself to somebody who is immensely wealthy, famous, powerful. They don't believe in Jesus. You're more blessed than they are. You are in a better place than they are. And God's aim in bringing us to salvation is to shower us with immeasurable riches. We are the most fortunate. We are the most blessed people on this planet. And we should learn to see ourselves that way. We don't do that nearly enough. You are seated at the right hand of God so that in the coming ages, you will be showered with more riches than you can possibly imagine. So why don't we enjoy that status? What keeps us from it? Sometimes it's... Let the demonic into our lives. Sometimes it's often that we cling to sin and find our satisfaction elsewhere. That there are pleasures, there's, there's ways to boost my self-esteem that, that are not of God. But they feel good at the moment. Be awesome. Be lust. There's all sorts of different things we can allow into our lives that we think give us momentarily satisfaction. They boost us up a little bit. They feel good for a minute. But they keep us from helping us to understand the fullness of God. There is only one place to find any satisfaction in this world, and it's God. Psalm 16, verse 2 says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Nothing. Nothing else. There is nothing else that will give us eternal riches except Jesus. A little later in that chapter, it says this, In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Doesn't that sound like what we should be chasing after? Doesn't that sound like what God has promised us? We should want that. Or the verse that we're looking at. We've had a few opportunities over the years as a family to do vacations at uh, Disney, either Disneyland or Disney World. I'll tell you, they work really hard at that place, making it the happiest place on earth. And I gotta tell you, we've had lots of fun there. It is, you know, 
lots of good things go on there. It's, you know, we've got great memories. But then I can also think of, uh, there was that one time, I lost my wallet in a restaurant in Disney. You know, that was a great memory. And, uh, man, it sure gets crowded there. And uh, parking there, man, I'll tell you, what a nightmare. Now, particularly when you live in a place like Viking, I'll tell you, sometimes you're not used to parking issues. We actually went there when I was a kid, when I was about 10 years old, went down to, to Anaheim. We drove all the way down, uh, uh, station wing and all four kids stuffed in the back seat. Um, drove all the way down to Anaheim. One, we spent a whole day there. I remember one of my biggest memories that I actually had of that trip when I was 10 was uh, going to Tom Sawyer Island and getting hopelessly lost. You see, Disney tries very hard to be the happiest place on earth, but there's going to be failures because it's not God's eternal kingdom. And there we have so much more. There won't be lost wallets, getting lost, parking problems. There won't be any of that. If you know the blessings of Jesus, you know everything you need for this world. And yet so often, so often we forget all that we have in these immeasurable riches. We act like somebody who's a millionaire who goes into an absolute panic because they dropped a quarter and rolled down the street. Order to the millionaire. We see something that we think goes wrong in our life and we, we forget the great riches, the blessings of God behind us. He has so much more for you. In his eternal kingdom, in this coming ages part, where we are promised physical vitality, mental clarity, spiritual satisfaction. And that's just the beginning. God has so much for us to happily be satisfied with everything forever. No futility in work, no futility in this life. What will come has already been guaranteed us by the fact that we're already in the throne room of God. Jesus is saying, you believe in me? You're already sitting beside me in my great kingdom. And it's just going to get better. So put aside the, the petty things that distract, the things that we think are important today, the things that boost our self-esteem here and make us think that we're important, the things that, that might seem important for this moment and put our full energy and resources into what is eternal and what will matter forever. To find our full hope in Jesus. To see ourselves all the time in the full richness of the kingdom of God and to place ourselves there all the time. To look around and realize I'm not seated in this world. I am seated in eternity. Heaven is always what I hold on to. Put our hope there. Be reminded of the fact that God has already done great things and he's taking us to somewhere better. Let's take some time to sing worship to that God.